Now on Daytime on 2, we tackle one of the problems of living in a confined space and attempt to fit into a bedsit everything that's needed to make it comfortable in mind stretches. Well, at least the rent's OK. And it's very convenient for the buses. And it's certainly nice and quiet. Lovely view. Yeah, I think I'd be comfortable here. Great, but um, don't you think you'd be a bit tight living here? I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit small, isn't it? Hmm. Still, let's have a think about what I'd need and how we could fit everything in. Mm. I'm sure I could do a lot with it somehow. Have you got the tape measure? Yeah. Right. First, there's a bed, uh -huh. a table, uh -huh. there's chairs, uh -huh. possibly a wardrobe. What do you think? Well, yeah, put a wardrobe. Put a wardrobe mm. down. It isn't good if we just put it straight, because if we put it a bit slanted, you can watch it from the bed. That's what we want you to do. Plan your own room. You'll need to talk it out. Then the planning. You can make your room any shape. These boys are trying different shapes out on a computer. So sleeping quarters, something like here, couldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Steps. Yeah, steps wouldn't really take too much. These girls have started with a plan and shapes for the furniture. You've got to make each one to scale. We've made your room for tight living 18 cubic metres. Cubic, that means space, and you can arrange it how you like. So your room could be quite wide and long, but then it would have to have a low ceiling, and a ceiling ought to be at least two metres high. Or your room could be long and narrow and quite tall. Remember, when you're designing, you can put things on top of one another if there's space. And one last thing, you mustn't forget a reasonable sized window and door. And you must include a wash basin, a bed, two chairs, a table, and some storage space. Hmm, it is going to be tight. Yeah. Trouble is, now I've got all the measurements and know what has to go in, I don't know how to work out where everything will fit to make the most of the space. Well, I suppose we could just get all the things and try them out and see. Oh, think of all that shoving and heaving. <laughs> yeah. Now I've got a better idea. Mm. Where's that piece of paper? Well, this. Let's make a plan. Great. This is one way of doing the planning. They're dividing every real metre by ten and drawing it on their plan as ten centimetres. The furniture sizes are in the notes and we want you to stick to them. Move that along oh, yeah. the chair there. Along the chair could go there. Yeah. Think it out a bit, get the table to the oh. chair. This group is marking out its design full size on their classroom floor. Mr Woolmer's talking it over with them. I think the point that will worry me most, though, is your cooker because you've got a source of heat there and potential danger and you've got very limited access. Also got the um, bed, uh, bed linen which could catch quite yes, easily. Yes, that is the point, isn't it? You've got all that material around and with a source of heat there and the material you have got a great deal of danger. Uh, it's a problem though, where else you will put it, isn't it? Could you move the upright chair? Of course you've got it by the sink. So, in the end, I decided the bed had to go there. Yeah. And I thought I'd put the sink here by the window, so I'll get all the light falling in the mirror when I'm washing. And I thought I'd put shelves up here over the mantelpiece for books and small things. Mm -hmm. It sticks out anyway, so I'm not using up any more space. That leaves the chairs and table. Oh, and there's one other big problem. Your clothes. Mm. Yeah. There isn't room for a proper wardrobe. Well, it could go across the window or the door. Funny, funny. No, I know there's some space somewhere. Well, what about over the bed? Yes, you could fix covers and things up there. You are a twit. How am I going to get up there? Well, um, first you take your shoes off and you get a chair. Then you climb up, balance on the bed, and then you... Fall backwards off the bed. No, thanks. No, I've got a much better idea. Supposing I raised the bed. I could have some cupboards underneath. <laughs> that is much better. You've still got the table and the chairs, don't you? Oh, yes. I could probably cram them in somewhere. I wonder, if we moved all that stuff in now... Well, you're going to have to sink there, though. I know, but if we move... If we...
In three minutes, we learn of the origin and exploration of one of the world's largest ore deposits, Pine Point Mine, which provides one of the Earth's physical resources. You're watching Daytime on 2. And now Earth's Physical Resources continues its look at Pine Point in Canada, one of the world's largest lead zinc mines. Thousands of tons of ore are mined in pits like this one, scattered over the thousand or so square kilometers of the Pine Point Mines property in Canada's Northwest Territories. And the ore minerals are the shiny gray lead sulfide galena and the brownish zinc sulfide spalerite. And the host rock in which these ores are found are limestones which were formed in a shallow reef environment about 400 million years ago. And those limestones have been extensively replaced by dolomites. But the ores themselves actually occur in underground collapse structures. And they formed when subterranean cave systems in the limestones simply collapsed. And there were lots of spaces in amongst the jumbled chaos of boulders in these collapse structures, and in those spaces, the ore minerals were precipitated. Now, associated with the lead sink uh, sulfides at Pine Point, there are a number of other things. There's bitumen that's found in cavities in the rocks all over the place. That's natural bitumen.
And there's this attractive yellow mineral. That's native sulphur. And there's another sulphide, iron sulphide. And that oxidizes rather easily and it stains the rocks brown. In Devonian times, about 400 million years ago, the reef in which these lead zinc ore bodies are now found was a barrier between open sea to the north, where shales were being deposited, and an extensive shallow basin to the south, where evaporites accumulated. But the reef itself, soon after it was formed, was uplifted. So there's a surface of erosion, an unconformity between it and the overlying shales which covered it later on when it subsided again. Well, so much for the summary of the geological relationships. Now, to, to understand the ore forming process, we need to consider three main questions. Those questions can be applied to any ore body anywhere in the world, not just here at Pine Point. The first question is, how was the ground prepared to receive the mineralization? The second question is, where did the necessary chemical elements come from and how were they transported? The third question is, what were the physical and chemical processes that control the precipitation of those elements in concentrations way above normal crustal abundances? Now we can consider each of those questions in the context of Pine Point, although, of course, they apply anywhere. The first question is, how was the ground prepared to receive the mineralization? Well, actually, that's not too difficult to uh, explain because, of course, preparing the ground simply means making spaces available for the ore minerals to be precipitated in. And there are two main ways in which that's happened here. The first is by the formation of dolomite networks with cavities in them. But much more important is in the formation of the limestone collapse structures. On these rather thinly layered limestones, we can envisage rainwater and groundwater moving along cracks and joints and bedding planes. And because those waters are acid, they dissolve out layers of limestone to make rather flat cavern systems. Larger caverns would develop along those limestone layers that were more easily dissolved. Once the caverns got big enough, the roof began to fall in. And the result was mainly tabular collapse structures. But there must have been some solution along vertical fractures as well. So in some places, there was a bell-shaped collapse structure extending upwards. This whole process wouldn't necessarily happen all at once. It could take thousands of years. And if the vertical structure reached the ground surface, you'd get a conical sinkhole at the surface, just like this one. The ground is undermined by the collapse beneath and it just simply falls into the hole. The next question is, where did the necessary elements come from and how were they transported? I can answer that by using a simple geological cross-section. 15 kilometers from north to south, the limestones of the barrier with their ore bodies, marine shales to the north, evaporites to the south, and the old fault in the Precambrian rocks beneath. Now the metals could have come from deep in the crust using this old fault as a conduit. They could have come from the marine shales because we know that marine clays absorb metals of all sorts and that those metals are expelled with the pore waters as the clays compact to form shale. The metals could have come from the evaporites because the residual brines which remain after the precipitation of the evaporite salts are highly concentrated with respect to base metals and so those waters could have moved into the barrier. And there's a fourth possibility, the limestones themselves because it's known that the calcite of marine limestones carries lead, zinc and other metals in small amounts metals which the calcite inher inherited from its parent seawater. But how could the metals have been released from the calcite? Well, the rocks have been extensively dolomitized, and dolomitization involves a complete reconstitution of the rock, and that process would have released the metals from the calcite into the pore waters. 
Now, sphalerite and galena are sulfide minerals. So where did the sulfur come from? The answer is easy to find, here in the evaporites. This is anhydrite rock, calcium sulfate. It's soluble, and so it releases sulfate ions into the pore waters. But how are those sulfate ions reduced to sulfide? Hydrocarbons. This is bitumen, and it's widespread throughout the whole of the Pine Point area. And the sulfate-reducing bacteria are known to reduce sulfate in the presence of hydrocarbons, and they produce hydrogen sulfide as a waste product. So we have sources for the metals and also for the sulfur. Now, we don't know the age of the mineralization at Pine Point. No doubt it happened way back in the geological past. But there are processes operating here today at the surface which give us clues to the processes which may have been involved in the mineralization. Where the ground surface cuts into the water table, you get a natural flow of groundwater to form a spring. But this spring is not so uh, clean as it looks. I'm going to test it for metal ions. And to do that, I'm using one of these handy little strips. 